Russell, the chair of the HIV Foundation. I'd like to welcome you here today. Um, it's a great turn up. Um, welcome you to our, our foundation. Uh, and uh, the topic is PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis to prevent HIV. So we've got some very good speakers and a panel and hopefully plenty of time for you all to ask the difficult questions. Um, and we'll, we'll get underway. I'd like to hand over now to our Master of Ceremonies, um, or Dungeon Master, as I think he may prefer to be uh, known, uh, Heath Painter, who's a Senior Pol Policy Analyst with the Victorian AIDS Council Gay Men's Health Centre in Melbourne. So I'll hand over to Heath. Thanks. Um, thanks, Darren, and thanks for supporting me to come up here. Um, as Darren said, my name is Heath Painter and I'm the Senior Policy Analyst at the Victorian AIDS Council in Melbourne. Um, I would just like to commence by respectfully acknowledging the Turrbal and Jagera people as traditional owners of the land on which this event is taking place and pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. I also recognise those whose ongoing effort to protect and promote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures will leave a lasting legacy for future elders and leaders. Uh, I also want to more formally acknowledge HIV Foundation Queensland for organising this event and for approaching me, a Melbourneian, to facilitate this forum. Let's talk about PrEP. While the forum is nicely placed to raise awareness about QPrep, a Queensland-run demonstration project assessing the feasibility of PrEP in Queensland, the rationale for this event is to discuss PrEP in general. Pre-exposure prophylaxis, or PrEP, is the use of HIV medication by an HIV-negative person at risk of HIV to, if taken as prescribed, stop HIV acquisition. This forum forms part of a wider national conversation on PrEP. And I come to this conversation as a queer guy working in the HIV AIDS sector in Melbourne and someone who spends much of their working time responding to PrEP in Melbourne and throughout Australia. In Melbourne last May, VAC organised a similar event in the lead up to the commencement of the VicPrep demonstration project, the Victorian equivalent of QPrep. And you'll hear more about that tonight. It's now over nine months since the first participant commenced the Vic Prep demonstration. And within months of starting, all 95 places on the trial reserved for gay men were filled. And shortly before Christmas last year, the New South Wales equivalent, uh, equivalent prelude commenced. A year ago before the demonstration projects commenced, conversations around Prep in Melbourne and Australia were largely academic. But the conversation is now very real. By this, I mean PrEP is part of the conversations that us gay guys are having as we negotiate risk and discuss sex. For those people who missed out on a place in the Victorian and New South Wales projects, importing generic PrEP has become a very real option. We have been advised that every week in Melbourne and Sydney, up to 50 people not in the demonstration projects are commencing a conversation with a sexual health physician about PrEP and the avenues available to access PrEP here in Australia. Effectively, many more people in Australia are taking PrEP than just those in the demonstration projects. From the park to the beach and other beats to the sauna and bedroom, PrEP is now very much a part of the prevention strategy being used by gay men to negotiate risk and sex in Australia. To me and many others in the HIV AIDS sector, PrEP presents a remarkable opportunity to extend HIV prevention to people who, for whatever reason, have struggled to use existing prevention strategies. PrEP alone is not going to end HIV and its impact at a population-wide level is yet to be properly understood. But at an individual level, PrEP's potential to alleviate the risks and anxiety around HIV transmission are profound. While this following list is by no means exhaustive, think of these instances where PrEP is already being used in demonstration projects in Victoria and New South Wales. The negative partner in a serodiscordant relationship who wants to open up the lines of communication and become more intimate. A sex worker who is economically reliant on a client or clients who demand raw sex. 
Individuals in our community who struggle to maintain an erection using condoms and who want to continue to seek pleasure and desire through sex. And injecting drug users who become disinhibited while under the influence of ice and or G. PrEP's capacity to facilitate sex and in so doing eliminate the anxieties around transmission potentially remove a whole cohort of people from being at risk of HIV. If we are to maximise the opportunities presented by PrEP, this prevention strategy needs to be understood and managed. I want to briefly highlight some of these issues. Firstly, cost and access. At the moment, PrEP is not approved to those outside existing demonstration projects. This means individuals who want to start PrEP need to purchase PrEP off-label at the cost of between $800 and $1,000 per month or import generics from overseas, which incur costs and time delays. Eligibility. In America, where PrEP was approved in July 2012, guidelines for administering PrEP are non-specific and do not exclude particular classes of people from accessing it. The question is, does this approach ensure that the people who can benefit the most from PrEP can actually access it? By this I mean men who have sex with men who are not connected to the community and or sexual health physicians and recently arrived migrants who are unfamiliar with the range of primary care facilities available here in Australia. Adherence and initial and ongoing screening. Central to PrEP's effectiveness is returning a negative HIV test before commencing a course of PrEP and adhering to PrEP as prescribed by a prescribing GP. The greatest risk to maximising the opportunities presented by PrEP is the use of PrEP by a person who is undiagnosed and living with HIV. The outcome is a potentially resistant strain of HIV that could compromise an individual's ability to treat their HIV, only exacerbating the complications that are experienced by living with the virus. And finally, gay on gay shame. And I say this as a gay guy talking to a mostly gay audience. To understand PrEP's utility in the Australian context, you need to understand and accept gay sex, the way we negotiate risk and the way we fuck. In the US, PrEP was met with considerable opposition from several commentators. Rather than being seen as a strategy that supports the health and well-being of individuals, PrEP was, and to a degree still is, cast as a strategy that increases promiscuity and risk. In effect, the boy in the US on PrEP is seen by many as a bad gay. But this is wrong. Every scientific trial on PrEP indicates that individuals who adhere to daily use of PrEP are at no risk of HIV, and further, their sexual practices do not drastically change. Accepting PrEP as an important health initiative that supports members of our community is critical. This empowers people at risk of HIV to commence a conversation about PrEP with their physician. In the alternative, by stigmatising PrEP, or by stigmatising PrEP users, we risk isolating individuals at risk of HIV from existing services. This compromises their health and the national response to the epidemic. PrEP is another tool in the suite of HIV prevention strategies that we as a community and as a country should embrace. At an individual level, we should provide all the support and assistance to individuals who stand to benefit from PrEP. To discuss these issues and other issues associated with PrEP and the QPrep demonstration project, the HIV Foundation here in Queensland has assembled a panel of experts to speak tonight. I'm going to introduce each speaker now in the order in which they are presenting. And at the end of each presentation, we will have a few minutes of questions for clarification in relation to aspects of their presentation. Um, uh, and after the final presentation, um, Simon O'Connor over here will join the panel uh, and we will have time for more substantive questions from um, the audience and from you about PrEP. So our first speaker tonight, and as I said, I'll introduce them all now and then um, they will go up individually. Our first speaker is going to be Dr. Andrew Redmond. Uh, Andrew is an infectious diseases physician at the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital. He has a long-standing interest in HIV medicine. 
He is a member of the Australasian Society for HIV Medicine, known as ASHAM, uh, the Australasian Society for Infectious Diseases, and a board member of the HIV of HIV Foundation Queensland. He teaches medical students, specialists in training, and general practitioners about HIV medicine. Next speaker will be Dr. Fiona Bishop. Fiona is a GP at Holdsworth House in Brisbane, having studied at the University of Queensland before this. Before studying medicine, Fiona gained a science degree with honours in microbiology and worked in an HIV research lab. She has been working in the area of LGBT health and HIV medicine since 2001. She is, an, she is able to prescribe HIV medicine and is able to offer holistic HIV management. Fiona is also Doc Q from Q News. And Simon Doyle Adams will also speak. Uh, Simon uh, is currently the clinical nurse uh, consultant at Cairns Sexual Health Service. Simon has worked in, HIV sexu in the HIV sexual health sector for over 15 years. He's a passionate about diversity and inclusive service provision and lives openly as a married gay man. And Simon will talk more about the Q Prep demonstration project. Um, also joining the panel, and I'll ask him to join, to come up and, and join the table after the presentations, is Simon O'Connor. Simon has held a number of community positions and provided support to people living with HIV since 1985. He is currently the Executive Officer of Queensland Positive People, QPP, and has held the position since 2004. Simon is also the Deputy Chair of the HIV Foundation Queensland. So with that all said, I'm going to invite Andrew to come up now as the first speaker. Thank you. Great. Okay. Look. Um, good evening, everyone. It's uh, it's 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 great to see so many uh, so many people, so many faces here, so many people interested to um, to discuss prep. And what I'm going to do is really talk about the scientific basis for it, um, as you see. There we go. So this is what I propose to talk about. Just what is what is prep? Is it effective? Is it safe? How does it fit into the HIV prevention toolbox? And then and then we'll have a short period of time, as as Heath alluded to. So look, essentially, I'm I suspect that most people really have a pretty clear idea. But from a definitional point of view, HIV, prep is is medication taken to prevent HIV infection. Um, the medication Truvada that has is a co-formulation of two oral medications is the best known prep and it's the best evaluated prep. However, there are other other drugs and other ways of giving prep are possible. So, um, if for example someone wanting to take prep or someone taking prep had problems with side effects or had problems um, with complications, we could look at other at other, at other forms of prep. And uh, in in years to come, I think that there will be other forms available. These might be medications. They might be long-acting intramuscular injections, which for people who struggle to remember to take something every day might be really helpful. Or um, or for women, there's there's trials ongoing with drug eluting vaginal rings. So, what about prep? How effective is it? Um, well, in I guess it's been evaluated in several trials. There have been many case reports of people saying, look, my patient has been taking this and despite high-risk exposures hasn't gotten HIV. But in a much more organised fashion, of course, we in medicine like to try to prove whether something works. And so really the, the gold standard or the, the Rolls-Royce of, of, of study designs is the randomised controlled trial where people um, who are at risk of getting an outcome are randomised to either get intervention A or intervention B um, to work out whether whether intervention the intervention works. There have been seven randomised controlled trials of PrEP, um, and you see them here. Um, those of you who, who who are who are interested will certainly have, are likely to have heard from the the news from Croy just very recently about the two top studies there, the Proud and the Ipergay study. Um, and but these studies on the on the uh, on the slide. They have a lot of differences, and, and, and really I just wanted to talk a little bit about those studies because they've got hugely divergent outcomes. Um, you can see that the African studies have really been um, either in women or in heter heterosexual men and women, um, and, uh, and, and one of them, the VOICE study, which was only relatively recently published in January, 
actually being on prep was worse than not being on prep. Um, and uh, in the fem prep study, there was almost no efficacy. Um, and then the, I guess the best known study prior to the release from Croy was the IPREC study, which was led by by Bob Grant from California. And it was mostly, um, actually most of the recruitment was in Latin America, um, in Peru and Brazil. Um, and that was really the headline study that led to, um, to the CDC bringing out the guidelines about PrEP use. And so that showed that, that there was a, the headline figure was a 44% reduction in transmission to the people who were randomized to receive active drug. However, in subsequent studies, it really was clearly shown that um, that in people who actually took the drug and people who had detectable levels of, of the drug in their system, the protection was much higher than 44%. But I guess it really highlighted something that there were an awful lot of people who had no detectable drug in their system, despite the fact that they were enrolled in a clinical trial and were being given um, the drug for free. So more recently, the Partners Prep had similar reasonably good efficacy and then really those two headline studies that have just come out the proud study and the ipo gay study um, conducted in i guess the setting in which we would envisage prep being administered in in australia is uh is is uh is um gay men who are at high risk of contracting hiv so men who are reporting um, significant numbers of of partners and having condomless sex with them um, showed really the very highest protection against HIV transmission, 86% um, protection in both of those studies in, in environments that, that share a lot of similarities with, I guess, um, Australia rather than perhaps the African environment. Why is there such a change? Well, it's, it's, it's tempting to look at adherence and, and I think that that's likely to be the answer. You can see in the far right-hand column that I've uncovered there that when you ask people, did you take the drugs? People say yes. They say, oh, look, you brought the bottle in. That's great. Let's count how many tablets are left. And people were very clever. They said, oh, yes, look, there's hardly any tablets left, so I must have taken all the drugs. But in a lot of the studies, in fact, when you took drug levels, there were only 30% of people actually had detectable drug in the system. And so people, are, people who participate in studies you know, really want to make people feel good about their participation in the studies and, and they have been, people are good at reporting that they're excellent at taking the drugs. And, and, and I think that it's really something that, it's not just a way of critiquing the study itself, but I think it also behoves us to think about just how this works for PrEP because often people who are thinking about taking PrEP are not people who are on seven other medications. Often they're people who don't have five other medical conditions and so taking a taking a drug every day is is often is often a, a new thing and a new experience for people who are contemplating taking prep um, really just to, to illustrate it very clearly this is a, a slightly old slide from 2013 but really it just emphasizes the point that there's quite a strong connection between how much you take the drug on the vertical axis and um, sorry, on the horizontal axis and how effective the drug is. We don't really know what the, um, how much people took the drugs in the new studies, but you can see that, uh, no pointer. Anyway, they'll be right up in the top right-hand corner in terms of effect, they'll be right up the top in terms of effectiveness, and I think we'd be pretty, we'd certainly expect that it's going to be right up there in terms of how many people were actually taking the drugs. So just briefly, some headline information from these very new studies that have been uh, reported at CROI. Um, so the PROUD study was in the UK. They recruited, um, recruited um, men from UK sexual health clinics who reported having condomless sex. And they randomised them either to start PrEP now or to start PrEP in 12 months' time. So um, people who were taking PrEP now, they knew they were getting the active drug. Um, and in, in the uh, and and there were three people in that arm, out of half of 245, or there you go, out of 276, who got HIV. Whereas in the arm, who were told we're going to make prep available to you in 12 months, there were 24 who got infected, and uh, and and so that calculates out as 86% effectiveness of the drug. Now, 
Heath alluded to this in the in the in his in introduction. Um, you know, is there a difference in sexual behaviour with people on prep? And 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 I don't really propose to have a long discussion about this because, um, quite frankly, it's you know it, it's it's not incredibly well studied. But I'd like to point out that in this study and in a number of others, in, certainly in the IPREX study and the IPREX open label extension study, sexual behavior was not different between the two arms. The other very new study is the IPOGAY study, a study conducted in France that had a very different model, but in the, a very similar population. So um, this was on-demand PrEP. So instead of asking people to take PrEP um, every day, whether or not they're having sex. This study asked people to take two tablets of Truvada in the, in the 24 hours before having sex and then take another one 24 hours later and a, and a fourth tablet 48 hours later. So it's a very different model and for people who are not having sex every day, this led them to being exposed to less drug which might then give you less side effects. So they, they recruited 400 400 men and randomize them to either take or take a blue tablet that may or may not contain Truvada and again you can see the arm that had Truvada had had two infections and the other arm had 400 infections had sorry 14 infections <laughs> there were 400 participants so but you see from from both of these studies that had very high level effectiveness and higher than in any other studies of PrEP that there were some infections so I guess the question is, is PrEP failing for those people? Um, and certainly in terms of being the, the study and what we call an, an intention to treat analysis, we would say yes, PrEP has failed. However, in the PROUD study, um, one of the people who got infected while randomised to the PrEP arm was positive at the first visit after starting. And so it's reasonably likely that that, that, that man was already infected with HIV when he started PrEP. Um, two of the others stopped attending clinics and then turned up a year later or more with, with, uh, with HIV infection diagnosed clinically and told their doctors that they had stopped taking PrEP. In the IPOGAY um, study, from the information that we have, it appears that they had, they had not been taking PrEP either. So I think we can conclude from that that really the effectiveness of PrEP is probably even higher than the 86% that it would appear. The big thing that we worry about with PrEP, we're about to give medication to people who don't currently have a medical problem or medic this is medication in order to pre prevent them getting a medical problem and what if we give people a problem by doing that? And so we need to think carefully about safety. I'd like to split it up basically into short and long term side effects and, and the short term side effects in my clinical practice looking after people with HIV, Truvada is the, is the best tolerated drug that I have in the cupboard. Um, that being said, it, there are some people who get some nausea, some diarrhea, some abdominal pain. Um, it's generally worst at the start of, of taking it and after a short period of time I'm really scratching my head to find anybody reporting significant side effects from the drug. We do worry about renal toxicity, both in the short term and in the long term, and I'm going to talk about that on, on, in, a, in a moment. There are some long-term side effects as well as renal. We worry about bone disease and the possibility that, that, that tenofovir itself might cause osteoporosis. And then the other thing that also Heath has alluded to is resistance in HIV. So with renal function, there is a small decrease in renal function when people take tenofovir. On average, people lose about 1 to 2 percent of their measured renal function. Um, there are small numbers of people who have more serious problems and there's a whole raft of various serious renal problems that people can get when they take tenofovir. Um, there is, um, the, these problems are generally reversible. Mostly what's been described is people having a small decrement in their renal function and then it just stays at that level. However, there are also people who start taking the drug and have progressive deterioration in their renal function. And um, 
and while that is generally reversible, that's obviously much more worrying. And, um, and it certainly means that we're not going to be wanting to give people prep and say, see you in five years. People are really going to need to remain under close supervision. And it really becomes a part of the weighing up for people working out whether prep is for them. With regard to bone mineral density, there's also a small decrease in measured bone mineral density in the PrEP studies. There's been no observed fracture increase, but on the other hand, fractures are actually pretty uncommon, and, and, and perhaps when we haven't given PrEP to very many people, this might be a, an important you know, canary in the coal mine about whether there really are issues. The high, there are higher risk of getting bone mineral density related problems if you've got a higher risk of already getting um, low osteoporosis, so being low body weight or having chronic disease are, are risks. The long-term implications of this are uncertain. The, uh, the nice people from Gilead will tell you that you'd be much better off taking their new version of tenofovir, which is um, you know, conveniently coming out as tenofovir comes off patent. But, you know. So the other really important thing that has also been alluded to is, is HIV resistance. So really there are two sort of two ways that you can get HIV resistance in the PrEP arena. One is you're taking PrEP, but it's not being absorbed very well, or you're not taking it all that often. And so there are, there is, the, the drugs are there in your bloodstream, but they're not there at high enough levels in order to protect you from getting HIV. And in that circumstance, you select out an HIV virus that is resistant to the drugs in, in Truvada. The other way that you could get resistant virus would be you've already got, been infected with HIV and then you start PrEP, but we don't know you've got HIV at the time. Perhaps the blood tests are negative at this, at this stage. Um, and then we treat you with only two drugs, or tenofovir and emtricitabine. And so we know from studies at the start of HIV treatment that if we treat people with two nukes, that treatment is, um, is destined to fail. And so that would be a problem for the, the PrEP recipient because not only have they had inadequate early treatment of their HIV infection, but we've burnt some really important and useful drugs for the treatment of HIV. So it is going to be critically important with PrEP that we make sure people have not got incubating HIV infection at the time. So just to finish up, where does PrEP fit into the HIV prevention toolbox? Well, gay men have been working hard for a long time to look after their sexual safety and to look after, pre, pre, try to avoid getting HIV while still having good sex lives. And, and they've been using all of these things on the, on the left here that you can read. Um, and and, and it, it might, I suggest that perhaps PrEP is, it's likely that different strategies are going to work for different people. And quite frankly, different strategies are going to work at different times for different people. And, um, and perhaps people are, I think, are probably already using different methods and we'll use different methods, you know, in combination at different times. And, and exactly where PrEP fits into that toolbox, I think, is going to be different for different people. And it might not be that the decision you make in 2015 is the same as the decision you make in 2017 or, or 2020. And so I think we're still going to work that out. So really, that's, that's the end of my slides. I'd be very happy to take questions about the topic and um, but then if you have things that you're ruminating on we can also talk about them later on. Thanks um, Andrew. Are there any, I, I want to have substantive questions or I think that's the best way to go about it after all the um, presenters have spoken but are there any acronyms or there, is there any little irking little bit of clarification that anyone wants from Andrew's presentation? There were lots of you know acronyms there, IFAGAY and IPREXLA and everything like that. Is there anything that people want clarification on? All right, well, we might um, uh, have a broader discussion later. So thanks, Andrew. Um, and now Fiona, who is going to look at PrEP more from the uh, GP perspective and more around the practical, uh, or the practicalities of utilising PrEP. Uh, thanks, Heath. Uh, so, um, first of all, I'd just like to apologise. I seem to be losing my voice today. And instead of getting my usual sexy Lauren Bacall one, it's kind of a bit squeaky and scratchy. So, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, and secondly, 
I'd just like to point out that there might be a little bit of overlap between what Andrew has told you and what I'm going to say. I'm going to say a little bit differently, but that's okay because they're important messages to get across. So um, we've already discussed what PrEP is. It's a prevention strategy where a negative person takes a daily pill to reduce the risk of infection. And the current PrEP is Truvada, which is emtricitabine and tenofovir. As Andrew mentioned, it's not currently licensed by the TGA in Australia and uh, it's not available on the PBS. And it's very important for everyone to know that PrEP and PEP are two very different things. And that PrEP does not prevent anything other than HIV infection. Um, so I wanted to talk briefly about some PrEP myths and I think that um, Andrew's done a good job of dispelling them already. <laughs> Uh, but the first one is okay, uh, that it might not be effective. Well, we've already seen from the studies that Andrew's presented that it certainly is effective. Um, we've got the IPREC study, which was um, also looking at not just gay and bisexual men, but also transgendered people, uh, transgender women, and people who inject drugs. Uh, we've also got the IPEGAY intermittent PrEP, the PROUD study that's just come out and um, what we know is that if you take it, it actually does work. Uh, so the next uh, myth is that it has bad side effects and I mean we always have to be talking to our patients about um, what to expect from a medication and um, what, what sort of side effects they're prepared to put up with. Um, so when we're treating HIV, people, I think, are much more willing to put up with a certain number of side effects because they're treating a serious infection. And uh, when we're giving someone, as Andrew said, a medication when they don't actually have anything wrong with them, uh, it's very important that they are fully aware of what to expect from it um, and make their own decisions about if that's something that they're prepared to put up with. But, you know, from the... Um, trials so far and for, certainly from our own personal experience we know that people do get some nausea sometimes some headaches some possibly a bit of weight loss but it really does seem to settle down very quickly for most people um, and Andrew's mentioned the creatinine the kidney function which generally is a reversible marker of kidney function that goes back to normal when they stop the Truvada and uh, the bone mineral density so the Kidney and bone are things that we talk about a lot in, um, in general practice when putting people on Truvada. Um, and the third myth, well, it's not really a myth at the moment because you, <laughs> you can get it, but it's going to cost you if you don't get on to the uh, study. So it's prescription only. You can get it for free if you're on one of the demonstration projects. Um, and if you try to get it from a local pharmacy, it's going to cost you a pretty penny, but um, there are some reputable online pharmacies where HIV drugs can be purchased. And I certainly have a number of patients who are, uh, don't have Medicare cards who are purchasing their drugs from AIDS drugs online. And um, it costs, still, it's, if you don't have an income, then it's um, unaffordable. But if you're waged, then it's about $100 a month to buy a packet of Truvada. Um, so, I guess talking about PrEP, we already know why we need it, but I'd just like to reiterate that despite everything we already have in the toolbox of prevention, that HIV rates are continuing to rise and we're all seeing new positive infections um, on a possibly weekly basis. Uh, condoms don't work for everyone. We know that PrEP works and people are already using it. Um, I have come across a couple of people who are, or actually more than a couple of people, <laughs> who are using friends' uh, leftover PEP or their own leftover PEP as PrEP. So it would be nice to be able to give people some guidance on how to use that properly and to monitor them <coughs> properly. Now, there are arguments against the use of PrEP and um, just being the devil's advocate, I'll bring them up. But I think most of these we can actually do away with. Um, so the first 
And this was a supposition that if people could uh, take a drug that would prevent HIV transmission, that it would lead to more risk-taking behaviour on their part and more condomless sex. In fact, what the uh, IPREX trial showed was, and what all of the trials have shown, is that in fact people's behaviour doesn't tend to change very much, or if anything, they tend to take more precautions. Uh, so um, that argument is completely unproven or disproven. And by the same token, uh, so we're not seeing an increase in STIs in those groups either, because they are actually having the same amount of condomless sex or less than they were before. Uh, we mentioned the long-term side effects. That is a possibility, and I think it's a, it's a very important conversation to have with patients before going on to these medications. Um, the cost is an issue, and I think not just the cost to the individual, but um, the cost to the community. And I think it's important to weigh up and to put a case for um, what the the cost is of preventing an HIV infection by putting someone on PrEP. So people aren't, if someone goes on a PrEP, they're not going to take it for the rest of their lives. They may take it for a sh relatively short period of time or for a few months or a few years. Um, it's still going to be cheaper than paying for a lifetime of HIV medication for that individual. Um, the concern about drug resistant strains I think that um, the IPREX trial really showed us that in the two people who developed HIV in that trial, that they were seroconverting most likely at the time that they went on to PrEP. And that's a really important point because I think that as a person who's going to be prescribing PrEP, it's my job to make sure someone doesn't have HIV before they start taking it. Because as Andrew pointed out, once you start on PrEP, if you've already got HIV and you don't realise it, it um, is a nightmare to manage. And the last argument is about the stigma, which Andrew briefly mentioned. And I was going to talk a little bit more about stigma. Why is there a stigma around taking PrEP? I mean, PrEP is a, f a form of protecting yourself. It's a bit like having a condom in your, in your wallet, but a little bit different, but it implies that an individual is having sex or that they're planning to have sex or that they'd like to think they might have sex or that they potentially might have sex but they're not sure when, might be tonight, might be next week, but they'd like to be prepared. Does it necessarily imply promiscuity? I don't actually think so. And certainly in people who are taking it in the confines of a of a long-term relationship, for instance. It certainly doesn't imply that. But I think that the stigma around it, it's really about sex. It's about sex and it's about HIV. Um, if you think about when the contraceptive pill first came out in the, in the 60s, there was a stigma associated with that because it implied that the person taking it was having sex and potentially having sex outside of the societally accepted parameters of being married um, and wanting to have children. So, um, but it was all about sex. So I think that's what the stigma really is. I mean, when I first heard the term, the term um, Travada whore, I was really disappointed because I think it's really hypocritical. Um, it's, yeah, I think it's, it's a very judgmental way to think about it. Um, and I see PrEP as an individual empowering themselves and being able to take control of their own health. Uh, this is uh, one of the poster boys in America for, I forget which state it's from but I had to include it because he's so cute. And it's the Boy Scouts motto. And you could just see him in the little hat. And, no, best not go there. But he's holding a Travada pill, little blue pill, and he's looking very pleased about it. So who should we be offering PrEP to? Well, obviously, any uh, sexually active men who have sex with men who have frequent condomless receptive anal intercourse. 
people who have multiple sex partners. Um, those people who have a positive partner who's not yet on treatment or who is on treatment with detectable virus. Um, people who present to my clinic frequently with sexually transmitted infections uh, like rectal gonorrhea because they basically fall into one of the above categories really. Uh, people who report methamphetamine use, whose lives are a bit chaotic, who are often unable to make good decisions in the heat of the moment. And uh, don't see this too often, but it does happen. There are people out there doing sex work who are not always able to insist on protection for themselves. People who can't use condoms. There's lots of people out there who can't use condoms for a variety of reasons. They can't get a proper erection anymore. They have other medical problems or medications that make that a, a problem for them. Uh, people with latex allergies. People who are unable to organise their lives in such a way that they have condoms when they need them. And uh, serodiscordant couples who are trying for a pregnancy, PrEP could be used in that setting as well. So from a practical perspective, um, when you go on to PrEP, this is what you should be expecting your doctor to do. Your doctor should be explaining the effectiveness of PrEP. They should be discussing the possible side effects that we've already mentioned. Um, they should be informing you of those potential long-term adverse events. Uh, and they should be emphasising the importance of adherence. And I've underlined this because I think it's actually the most important part of the whole message. If you don't take the pill, it isn't going to work. Uh, they would be explaining to you the need for monitoring and what... I'll go into the monitoring in a little bit more detail in a minute. They would be checking for interactions with any other medications you might be taking or over-the-counter things. They'd be ordering some baseline blood tests. So the two most important tests that you would have would be an HIV test and a kidney function test. And they'd also be making sure that you're vaccinated against hepatitis B uh, because if you are planning to have condomless sex, we'd like you to not catch HIV catch hepatitis B at the same time. Um, just a few notes about acute HIV infection. So what we really want to do is find the people who are coming in to get PrEP who are actually already infected. So it's really important to think about that when someone comes in asking for PrEP because anyone who's a candidate for PrEP is at substantial risk of already being infected. So I'd be suspicious of anyone who's coming in with signs and symptoms like fever, rash, sore glands, diarrhea, those sorts of things. And um, I would be, uh, if anyone who I've, I'm concerned has had symptoms in the previous month, I'd potentially be asking them to do some follow-up testing before starting the PrEP. So monitoring. Uh, so in monitoring, probably the most important thing I would be monitoring is a patient's ability to be taking the pill, so their adherence to the medication. And I would be offering them at the very beginning some ideas about how they could improve their adherence. And so there's lots of ways to remember to take a pill. And uh, anyone who's got HIV knows that knows about all of these uh, little uh, tricks already. You can get alarms and apps for your phone these days. You can have pill boxes. Now, don't diss the pill box. I know it's a bit granny, but they are fantastic. And I don't know if you've ever had a course of antibiotics and looked at the packet and gone, God, did I take that one this morning or not? I mean, it's really, really hard to remember every single day. And uh, so pill boxes are great. And you just have to make it a part of your daily routine. So that's one of the things I'd be monitoring uh, at visits. The other thing I'd be monitoring is to make sure they're not having any side effects and if they are that they're 
hopefully settling down. Um, and I'd be offering a three monthly um, test for HIV and other sexually transmitted infections and I'd probably be doing um, at least once a year a protein, a urine protein test to check for kidney problems associated with Truvada. So that's the monitoring side of it. And I guess we'd also be monitoring, you know, the individual's desire to continue taking the PrEP. And if they've decided they might want to stop, giving them some advice about how to do that. So I think at the moment the guidelines in general use are that you should wait, you should continue taking the PrEP for 28 days after the last condomless sex in much the same way as we use PEP for 28 days continuously. Um, that advice may change and I mean the results from the IPGA study um, about intermittent PrEP dosing are very interesting and raise some questions about, about that. Um, so just lastly I wanted to go through a few frequently asked questions and things that people might be uh, wanting to know the answer to. So alternatives to Truvada as Andrew mentioned there are some but they're not currently being recommended and the main reason for that is that there isn't enough data to support their use. They haven't been uh, thoroughly investigated yet as a PrEP um, alternative. But I think in the future, the injectables will be fantastic once they become available. Um, so what do you do if your partner has a resistant HIV strain? Can you still take PrEP? Um, I think the very key question here to ask is, do they have a detectable viral load? So if someone's got resistance, um, they may have been put on a regimen that's been tacked together that manages that quite well and they may, may be undetectable. And if that's the case, then you would treat them like anybody else. But if they do have detectable viral load, and I don't want to get too technical here, but if they have a particular mutation called K65R, then that would render their virus potentially resistant to tenofovir, which is in Truvada. So that would probably be uh, someone who wouldn't be suitable to take Truvada as PrEP. Uh, what if I get HIV whilst taking PrEP? Well, as we've already pointed out, if you're taking PrEP and you were negative when you started taking it, then you probably won't get it, and almost certainly won't get it. But the key thing here is that we make sure you don't have it before you start. So because um, there is a potential for resistance if, if you go on to PrEP and you already have HIV or if you get HIV. So if you're taking your PrEP but you're not taking it all the time or you're forgetting a lot of the time, then there's a risk that you could become infected. Uh, and, if, uh, and PrEP is not the same as PEP, so you can't just think you've... You can't just forget to take some PrEP, go out and have sex, and then go, oh, I'll just go back on the PrEP now because it doesn't work that way. You need to take it beforehand. So you have to make sure you're negative before you start and get tested regularly. And I know I haven't actually answered the question because if that happened, then you'd need to be coming and having a conversation with your clinician about what to do next, and it would be complicated. But it would almost certainly involve you going off the PrEP straight away. Um, what if you have Hep B already? If you've got Hep B, Truvada may well be a good choice for you. Um, but if you have Hep B, you can't suddenly stop the Truvada because you could get a flare of your Hep B. And the final question is the $64,000 question, uh, which is, do I still have to use condoms? Well, in an ideal world, Everyone would continue to use condoms because they're still the best, cheapest, safest way to prevent HIV and they protect you against other STIs. What we have to remember is that in the PrEP studies so far, people reported that their condom use remained the same or improved while they were taking PrEP. They didn't stop using condoms if they were using them. So we have to keep that in mind when interpreting the results of the studies Ultimately, in the end, I think it's a personal choice for the individual and what's going to work for them best. And that's it. Does uh, anyone have any burning questions?
Ada? Well, this is true. Uh, that's a complicated question. <laughs> I guess I'm talking about a monogamous relationship where that much is known because when you're talking about multiple partners and casual partners, you don't know anything about their HIV history or what mutations they might or might not have. So, you know, you've got to roll with the flow there, I guess, and take the risks that you're prepared to take. Yeah. Fernie, I've got a question. I've heard different things about PrEP. Is PrEP something you can um, uh, like cycle over a period of time? Like one might want to go onto a holiday to, say, Paris, and they might think, OK, I'm going to take PrEP for a week mm. to build the levels up. Then when I get back, I'm going to stop PrEP and then take PrEP again in another 10 months when I prepare for my next holiday. And then the reason yeah. might be they might, you know, might be thinking about the long-term side effects. Is that a feasible thing um, beyond the um, trials? I think that's totally feasible and, and probably in some ways more sensible and, 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 and if you are using it with direct, good, good um, guidance, I think it could actually work extremely well for you and you'd be less likely to get long-term consequences because you wouldn't be taking it so often. And it could be just as effective possibly in, in those sorts of circumstances? I think so, so long as you followed the recommendations about how how long beforehand you take it and that you take it continuously and that you take it for a certain period of time afterwards. Absolutely. Yeah. And Thank in fact, you. that's how I envisage people would take it. I guess not everyone's planning to have sex um, every day or every week of their lives. Some people are, I know, but... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I actually just want to ask one question about that mutation. So this yeah. is a kind of community question. If you're... Um, if you're on, let's hypothesise you're on prep and you're, um, you know, you have a grinder hookup, or you're at the sauna and, and you meet some guy and, and he says um, um, he discloses his status, should you, or, or what's your recommendation around asking him what medication he's on? And if he says, uh, or should you ask, are you on Travada? And he says no, would that prompt you to use condoms um, uh, to, to manage that risk? I think that the, the, the simpler question to ask Heath would be, do you have detectable virus? Because if he's undetectable, it doesn't matter what um, resistance um, mutations he's got archived because they won't be floating around. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. okay. Thanks, Fiona, for that um, presentation. Uh, the final presentation is going to be Simon, um, who's going to talk about um, the demonstration project here in Queensland. So I think it's probably <coughs> relative to everyone here um, but me, but I'm still very interested in it. So Simon uh, is going to talk about the QPREP. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I represent Cairn Sexual Health in beautiful far north Queensland. I suppose on behalf of the service, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional landowners on the land we meet tonight and give our respects to the elders, both past and present. Um, now I'm the last presentation, so I've used a bit of poetic license and got lots of pictures of men. I liked often to sit in my office up in Cairns looking at these men. So hopefully if I get particularly boring or you get glaze over, just focus on the men. I know I have quite a lot. Oop, oh, that one. Ah, there you go. Very good. Okay, so basically, um, so our question really is can we implement PrEP uh, in Queensland, and if so, how can it work? So obviously the trials are telling us that PrEP does work. We know that if guys are taking it properly, then it, it does provide protection. But what we're looking at really, as we're saying, um, due to the cost and the fact that it's not available sort of mainstream uh, in Australia and certainly not in Queensland, if we were to roll this out, what would it look like? How would people access it? Where would they access it from? And, wh and what are the realities, I suppose? Because if, you know, when we're looking at our healthcare dollar, if we're asking, you know, governments to actually invest in this, we need to have the evidence to say, yes, in Queensland, it worked. These were the issues and, 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 and this is what we need to do. So I suppose it's really looking at how it works properly. Yep. 
So the, the project aims is to assess the acceptability and feasibility of PrEP provision throughout sexual health clinics and general practice services, so the S100 prescribers are the GPs that are specialists in HIV throughout Queensland, uh, and then basically to assess um, how acceptable this is going to be for guys that are actually taking PrEP. Um, and we want to look at the adherence, so we want a very honest look really, so I know within the other trials guys have been saying yes we've been taking the medication and maybe sort of hiding a couple of pills when they've come in for their pill count which we will be doing but I suppose what we're looking at really is 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 the sort of real sort of like practical in Queensland today how does PrEP actually work and how does it work for guys how do guys feel about it how you know whether they trust it whether it changes their practice we want a sort of honest look really on what actually happens in PrEP with PrEP. And then from this, we want to then develop a guideline to show, so if we're going to roll this out, you know, what's this going to look like? Um, you know, what sort of standards are we going to need to have in place in order for PrEP to work in Queensland? So the study design, so it's a multi-site. That basically means there's a few sites in, involved, and you can see them there listed. It's open label, so people that are on the trial, they are going to get the, the PrEP, the Truvada drug. So we're not trialing the drug, we're just trialing how it actually works in practice. Um, as I say, it's a demonstration project, so it's not a clinical trial. I know we had some questions before about whether this data was actually going to add to the international data. We're saying that we know that PrEP works, we just want to know how it works in practice in Queensland. And whenever I started, when I came to Queensland, I was told that Queensland's quite different. So I think maybe that's why we want our own trial. So the study participants, um, basically, uh, we want gay men. Who doesn't, I suppose? <laughs> and so, and, and, and at the moment, to here in Queensland, there's just 50 places. I think when we consider this a couple of years ago, when, when PrEP wasn't quite as popular uh, as it is, we thought 50 places might actually be quite difficult to fill. I think we could probably fill that in a busy afternoon in care and sexual health. Guys are really, really keen on wanting to start PrEP. And I think because there's more international discussion, there's more evidence, as we've seen tonight, so guys are seeing this as, for some guys, this is uh, you know, a, a very sort of realistic op um, option for them. So we're looking for HIV negative guys. Obviously, we don't want to recruit people that are positive because we'd want them to be on treatment anyway. Um, and we're basically, we have a bit of a joke in our clinic that if we get some sort of cute guy that's quite busy, wanders into the clinic, we want to have a conversation with them about PrEP. And it's basically we're looking for guys that are most at risk of, of HIV and we, we're wanting to offer. We don't want to offer guys that are not at risk of HIV because equally, you know, if they're using other forms of prevention, you know, then, then you know, we, we want to get those guys that are the, the, the busiest, I suppose. So how we're viewing that really is we're looking for unprotected anal sex with a regular HIV positive partner that has detectable viral load or isn't on treatment. So because I suppose we believe in, in treatment as prevention, so if somebody's on therapy, they're unlikely to pass a virus on. We obviously uh, don't want to recruit their, the, the partners of, of positive guys on treatment. Um, and then we're looking for guys also that have unprotected casual sex as well. And how we're going to benchmark that is we're looking that in the last three months, have they had episodes of unprotected um, anal sex with casual partners or unprotected sex um, with partners that are positive and not on treatment. So that's pretty much we're looking in the back of their, their last three months to see whether they're eligible for the trial. So this is probably one of my favourite photographs. I was looking forward to this bit in the uh, presentation. <laughs> uh, so eligibility. So basically looking for guys that are over 18, they're able to give written uh, informed consent. That's basically we want you know guys to be able to sort of uh, give consent to the to the to the, the trial. They need to be HIV negative on enrolment, and that sort of makes sense. They need to be Medicare eligible, and that's not about excluding people that are Medicare ineligible. It's the fact that if they're going to see their GP, they're needing to have um, pathology taken, or if there's any side effects to the drugs and end up in hospital, it'd be a bit sort of wrong of us to, you know, to give people medication if they then don't have access to, you know, to, to Medicare for that, to that care. They need to be willing and able to participate, and that sort of makes sense, really. They need to be fluent in English. Although, as a, as a POM, I'd argue that maybe some Australians would struggle with that. <laughs> <laughs> and they need to be, and we need to be able to contact them throughout the, um, throughout the project as well. 
to the exclusion, so the sort of bounces on this trial, really. Um, so if they're confirmed HIV positive, then they will be excluded. If they've got signs of acute HIV infection, so it may be that the HIV test is not showing reactive, but yet they look like they could have HIV or, or seroconverting, then we would exclude them. Of course, we'd want to test them and bring them into care, so that would just be an exclusion for this. Um, if they've got clinically significant issues, for example, like TB or cardiac problems, if they are, um, have got uh, hepatitis B and they're positive hepatitis B because there'll be uh, a problem with the, the medication and that. If they're taking some types of medication that would be contraindicated for the, for the Truvada, so obviously we don't want to uh, recruit people if the drugs are going to cause them problems. If they've got mental health or cognitive impairment, so if they're not able to understand what's going on with the trial, obviously we don't want to, it'd be unethical to recruit people that would have uh, mental health issues or, or issues with understanding what the trial was actually about. Um, and if, if the, the fact is, if they were, I don't know, travelling or tra travelling in and out of Queensland a lot or likely to be you know, going off and living in another country, then clearly we'd, we wouldn't want to recruit them into the trial because we wouldn't be able to retain them. And if they're unwilling to actually adhere to any of the, the study requirements, so if they say, yes, I'll have the drug, but I'm never going to come back into the clinic again, then clearly we won't be recruiting. So what's involved? So you can see here there's a picture at the bottom. So basically it is taking the Truvada, which is a nice blue tablet, and also we're still encouraging um, safer sex practice as well. So um, they need to continue with their safer sex practices. But of course, we're also then saying that we want to recruit people that are having, having unprotected anal sex. So I suppose it's, we don't want them to change their practice. Um, I suppose we don't want to put them more at risk of HIV, but you would argue then when they're actually on PrEP and they're at less risk of HIV. They need to consent to be part of the study. There's going to be six study visits in the clinic during the 12 months. So that does sound quite sort of... Um, laborious maybe for, for some people but a lot of that is around recruiting them and also making sure that we are testing them throughout those um, throughout that year that they're going to be on prep and that's part of good clinical care and for some guys I suppose the guys we would want to recruit to the trial we'd be asking them maybe to come in at least four times a year anyway for their routine sexual health screening and HIV testing so it may not be any more than than guys are doing anyway there's a screen and enrolment process, so we, there will be an, a screening visit, which I'll go on to in a bit more detail. Uh, and then there's a completion of a short survey three times during the study uh, and then when they leave the study. So the idea really is to get that real idea of guys on PrEP, how is it for them, how does it work for them, what issues they have, so we get a sort of, you know, because it's that sort of data that we're looking for. So the screening visit, we can't guarantee he will be there at every visit, but we will try. And so there's an inclusion and exclusion criteria checklist. So depending on which service you would be um, going to to, to uh, start on the PrEP trial, that, that would either be a nurse or a doctor, depending again on which service you go to. So they're basically looking for HIV and syphilis, so that would be HIV and syphilis testing. There'd be urine, throat and anal screening, so just the routine screening for STIs will be taken at this time. Also screening for hepatitis B, and as we were saying, if found positive, then offered vaccination. Sorry, negative, uh, um, they would be offered vaccination if they needed to be. And also kidney function testing as well, which is just a urine test. We'd have a discussion on HIV and STI risk discussion, and I think that's probably one of the most important things for guys at the moment, because there's so much information out there around how guys do re reduce their risk of HIV, maybe through sexual practice, through treatment as prevention, through PrEP, through PEP. So I think it's important that all clinics actually have those discussions anyway, but certainly on this trial. Uh, and then we also would give people condoms and lube as well. So we've got all bases covered. It's very confusing. I've got two buttons and I want to press both of them at the same time. So enrolment visit. So we go through the results, obviously, to make sure that the, the, um, if there's anything uh, positive or any STIs, then we can treat them. And obviously, we'll be reviewing the HIV results, although hopefully be, uh, HIV testing will be done by rapid test anyway, so we'd know the first visit. We'd want to make sure that the eligibility is met, so we go through that checklist. So again, we want to have a discussion around their, 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 their sexual risk and, and make sure that everything's good there. Uh, we want to 
have a discussion about adherence because obviously we know from the trials that if guys are taking the medication properly um, and on time then that obviously is giving them that um, that protection from HIV so that's really important they'll be given one month of the drug free of charge the drug is free th throughout the whole um, the whole study uh, then we would recap the main points so guys are feeling completely comfortable with with what they're on the trial for and and uh, obviously um, the drugs that they need to be the drug they need to be taking um, and then we also have a questionnaire which basically goes through sort of demographic um, information about the guys that would mainly be about um, education language spoken um, country of origin and then lots of questions around people's perceptions around prep around risk around um, around sex as well those questions are those questionnaires are confidential, so you don't hand them back to the clinician. So those questions would be would be filled in and then sent. So the clinician that you see isn't the one that's going to see what your personal thoughts are. See again, I'm confused by the two buttons. So the ongoing monitoring. So they're monitored at months one. So that's when you again you see how people are travelling on the drugs, um, make sure that everything's okay. At uh, 3, 6 and, and 12, there's uh, STI screening, um, again, and then also uh, the next script for the drug. So, the, so we really wanted to monitoring that real life experience with PrEP uh, and also the practicalities of actually taking it and how does it work uh, for guys and whether there are any side effects. We know that the side effects should be fairly uh, minimal, uh, but we want, really want to see how, how it is for guys. And again, we want to be doing STI screening and then discussion about risk reduction. I suppose you would argue that if somebody is actually on PrEP, then that is a quite an effective risk reduction strategy. So time scales. I've saved the best, well, I believe the best picture to last because this is probably the, 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 the hardest question we've had at the moment. Try, often getting trials uh, off the ground and filling in copious amounts of paperwork for, um, for governance um, in each individual site that are, is running the trial and because, it's, because a drug is involved is taking us a huge amount of time. Governments aren't known for their speed. Um, and, and, and so we're hoping by June we'll be able to roll, uh, roll this out. Hopefully before then, we were hoping that tonight we'd be able to sort of announce an earlier date. Um, but we've, again, we've, we're sort of waiting on a little bit more paperwork. So hopefully June, um, and then there'll be quite a lot of publicity around that. But in the meantime, maybe you can just focus on him. And maybe not too much. Okay. Thank you. Um, we might actually just launch into questions. Simon, do you want to come and join the, the panel? Um, and thank you, Simon, for um, taking us through the QPREP demonstration project. I hope it does start sooner rather than later. Um, so this is your opportunity to ask some questions about PREP. I think they were very comprehensive um, presentations and a lot was covered. Um, I know that um, the HIV uh, Foundation has taken questions through um, the internet and I've got a series of questions here um, and they somewhat um, ask, well they will prompt replies as to the information we've already been given but I think they ask really good questions that reiterate um, some of the major points around PrEP. And I'm, I might actually ask one first um, and it's actually, I think Andrew, you're probably best placed to ask to answer this question, just just to get the our thinking going, um, uh, has there been any studies showing to what extent the use of prep in conjunction with condoms reduces HIV transmission when compared to the use of condom use alone? I don't think that we really I don't think we really know the answer to that question specifically. I guess we've been. Um, advising people, gay men, to use condoms ever since HIV came around. And uh, those of us who've sort of been in the field for a while would, you know, I can think of dozens of, dozens of advertisements and campaigns that I've seen over time. Um, and so there's, on the one hand, there's been this continual reinventing of this condoms are great, use condoms message. And then on the other hand, there's, there's, there's PrEP, which sort of acknowledges, I think, you know, in the back of my mind, acknowledges that people don't always use condoms. And, and I think that message has been difficult for the 
hey, let's use condoms, they're great mm. campaigns to, to work with. And, and I think the PrEP studies have really tried to capture people who don't use condoms all the time and, um, and have often given advice about, well, look, we would just like to explain how condoms work and how condoms can help you avoid getting HIV. But because we recognise that that doesn't work all the time, look, here's PrEP as well. So I don't think it's incredibly well understood and I think it's very difficult to unpack because of, because of the difficulty with just clarifying you know when condoms were used it's you know it's and 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 when people were coming back to the back to the study in the clinic you know they would struggle to say i guess that oh i didn't take very many of the medications and so i think it's also difficult to get really clear information about well what proportion of the time were condoms used and it's a really good question, but I think it's really difficult to answer, and I don't think we can give a you know a nice numerical kind of answer. Thanks. Um, does anyone want to ask a question in relation to that, or or anything else? Before I ask another question that we were provided through the internet. Yeah. Hi. Um, I just wanted to know. So there is fifty places, but is there going to be assigned? allocations to say Cairns or Ipswich or is it just everywhere? Simon. So uh, 49 for Cairns I think and then one for <laughs> <laughs> uh, No it's very much a first come first serve yeah. uh, basis so yeah but but I'd, I'd imagine the um, the places might I, I suppose yeah we'd want to have some sort of equity uh, but then I suppose that there are a few guys that are already waiting to go on to the trial so, so maybe I don't know with and certainly within Cairns we've got a few guys that have sort of expressed an interest already and they're sort of they're not on a waiting list certainly but we will inform them um, as soon as the, 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 the trial is open so maybe the, the other sites I don't know whether they would be happy equally having a sort of an, an idea of, of the who's interested. Thank you. Can I just ask, just, I'll just get you to use this, um, this mic, thanks. Hi, sorry. Um, it was in relation to your study design, because I know you chose some um, health services there. How was it done? So we, we offered services uh, throughout Queensland who would actually want to be part of the trial. Um, and initially it was uh, the sexual health clinics and then I suppose uh, then sites have, have come on board. Um, and the issue is as well that has made it more complicated is, is because it's not just Queensland health sites, then the ethics um, approval uh, process has, uh, has been more complicated because there are, there are, there are multi-sites. But basically it was with whichever sites wanted to be involved could, it, could have been involved. And sorry, I have another question. Um, I know one of the criteria there was they had to be fluent in English. So what if they were a high-risk gay man who is culturally and language diverse? Could they get into the trial, or do they have to pass like a certain IELTS score to be accepted? No, no. I, th I think it, it. I suppose for us, it would would be that we just want to make sure that you know that, that people are able to understand what they're consenting to, uh, and again, that would be for any sort of research to make sure that you can say actually, you know, the person that consented to this was fully understood the information was, you know, and there's. So, so that would just be good sort of process, really. So it wouldn't be around reducing access, um, because if somebody wasn't able to actually recruit to the trial, it could be that they could then be offered uh, a private script for for prep and maybe import the drugs anyway. So it's not about excluding; it's just that for this, because it's quite sort of in, you know can be quite intensive. There's questionnaires they need to fill in, you know, uh, clearly with somebody that, that struggles with English, um, you know, it, it'd be it'd be problematic for them to to take part. I just want to ask a question to Fiona. It's one we've got here, and you, you did answer this in your presentation, but I think it's a really important point because it, it addresses the confusion between PrEP and PEP. And someone asked a question here, if I have unprotected sex, um, and, and I take it that um, the question is asked in the context of someone actually being on PrEP and, not, and stopping the course of medication. Uh, they ask the question, if I have unprotected sex, can I still take the pill within, i.e. Travada, within 72 hours, how many pills do I have to take? Yeah, I saw that question and I was a little unclear. Yeah, perhaps if we hypothesise that the person is on 
is in a demonstration study or is importing it and they stop it and then I think what they're saying yeah I, I see it as kind of like well can I just start using this as PEP without going to get an HIV test or mm. whatever the case mm. may be well I mean in that case the answer is it depends <laughs> because um, we do sometimes just offer Truvada on its own as PEP um, if depending on what the level of risk is that we think um, the person's exposed themselves to. So, you know, there's a table that gives you the list of the most risky down to the least risky things you can do depending on the person you've done them with and what you did. Um, and so if we think someone's exposed in fairly low risk activity, but there's a lo so there's a low risk of HIV exposure and we want to put them on PEP, we might just put them on Truvada in which case he could go on to Truvada and he would need to start it within 72 hours and take it for 28 days. But if it was a high risk activity, so for instance with a known positive person and it was unprotected anal sex, then I'd be saying that probably on its own that's not enough and that they would need to have a third agent, a second pill that they take along with the Truvada. So I think, I think the answer is to you really need to go and see a, a, a doctor yes. in that case. And I will say, um, Fiona was referring, you were referring to the MPEP guidelines there, yes. which are actually available on the internet. But I, I, I mean, it's best to um, consult that with a doctor with you, know, with you um, in terms yeah. of understanding the hierarchy of risk. Yep, thank you. Yep, there's a question just over here. Just in regards to fertility, is there a risk of reduced fertility whilst on PrEP? Um, Andrew, are you able to answer that question? I don't think we have any information that tells us that that is the case. Um, there, are some, there are some caveats about, about um, that some of the drugs when given to pregnant you know, rodents in, exam in, in, in experiments have led to um, have led to abnormalities in rodent fetuses, but quite frankly, the um, I guess the circumstance in which we really have much more experience is in peop is in women who've got HIV who are on antiviral treatments, and in fact, um, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of women in that circumstance, many of whom have become pregnant and had children. And, um, and I guess we know that in those circumstances, the rate of birth abnormalities is, is generally no higher than the background rate of birth abnormalities. Um, I think we have less good information about, about, um, about male sperm. Um, and, um, but, uh, and there are certainly, on the product information, there is, you know, they're not category A drugs, which are the ones that we feel safest about prescribing. But I guess I would say that we don't really have any, any hard evidence to make us concerned about it. And, um, and certainly for serodiscordant couples where, you know, we're advising, if for serodiscordant couples for whom, you know, it's really important that the, that the, that the male partner in the, in, the, in the partnership is, you know, is the, the biologic father and they're not happy to arrange fertility other ways, I think essentially we don't have high level concerns about them. But it's pretty early days. Phil, down here. I'll come to you next. Thanks. So I've got about a dozen questions I want to ask. Um, I want to start with an observation first. As somebody who was involved in those dozens and dozens of condom campaigns back for 30 years now, this is a real turning point. This is a real game changer. And I would hate to think that we lose the opportunity to make a real inroad into stopping the epidemic through fighting battles amongst ourselves um, that I can already see happening overseas. You mentioned before about the thing about sex and, and people's reaction to people who they think are having more sex than they are. Um, I think it's a really, really important thing to, to talk about. Th this is the first time I, I can see that the whole HIV prevention campaign is coming down to, in my opinion anyway, uh, the relationship between a doctor and a patient, an individual interaction between two people, when in fact the success we've had in HIV prevention for 30 years has been about a community-led campaign, community norms, community standards, um, community expectations of ourselves and each other. 
And I think it'll be a mistake to have uh, a PrEP campaign without an allied campaign, a really strong campaign about stigma. Stigma between ourselves, because I think that Travada horse stuff is, is very real amongst gay men, shaming each other about who's, who's using Travada and why they're using it. But I also know here in Queensland, and having lived here for 25 years, um, the notion of conservative um, members of the general community seeing this as an excuse to provide gay men to have all, to have this, this, all this money for these pills so they can fuck like bunnies. Uh, to which my answer is, well, why not? Because um, I think that's, that's what we fought for back in the 70s and 80s. Um, so I'm, I suppose what I'm saying is, please don't let this come, come down to a simple, it's not a simple, a clinical trial between doctors and patients, but it has to be within the envelope or with the, within the, the context of a broader campaign about stigma itself and about uh, something that's sex positive. That this, is an ex this is an excuse, a, a reason, uh, a, 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 a way that we can reclaim that pride that what we did was good. Thanks. I think it's a really good point and it's something in Victoria that um, we have been extremely conscious of. I guess you refer, it's kind of like lateral violence. Um, I'm actually going to say, Simon, um, Simon O'Connor, I was wondering whether you wanted to make a comment or indeed Simon next to you, both um, gay men, about, um, about managing as community leaders, about managing the risks of Travada and PrEP um, dividing our community rather than unifying it. Um, we, in actual fact, PrEP should be seen as um, something that empowers, to use your words, Fiona, um, rather than something that divides. And in, in the context of what's happened in America where it has been really divisive and damaging and there are low n numbers of people taking, taking um, up PrEP, I'm just wondering whether the two of you have comments about that as community members. Thanks. <laughs> it's sort of like Simon 1 and Simon 2, isn't it? Um, I think it's a really important point that you raise, Phil, and it, um, it, it kind of fills me with a bit of horror when I, um, you know, heard the first, first time I heard the term Truvada whore, um, because uh, the positive community obviously is very well um, experienced in dealing with stigma. Um, and to think that stigma is now being directed at people who are um, maybe considering taking um, steps to prevent a transmission, just I, I don't get it. Uh, I, I don't hear of anyone being called a condom whore. It's the same thing. It's another form of prevention. So we welcome people that use condoms and think that's the right thing to do, but someone that's taking something, albeit that it's something new that we haven't perhaps gone down this path before, but it's a similar thing. It's a different kind of prevention. So why are those people being stigmatised for doing something responsible? Um, the whole thing about it is it's about choice, um, from my point of view. And the positive community is very um, uh, kind of knowledgeable about that in that 30 years ago we had no choice. Um, positive people had no choice in relation to treatments because there weren't any until um, they dusted off AZT to see how it would work with people with HIV and, and people with HIV were being overdosed. Um, not deliberately, but because we didn't know what the right amount was. And the gains that we've made in HIV in a very, very short period of time in the last 30 years, which has been remarkable in that, you know, we've moved away from HIV being a death sentence into a chronically manageable illness, has, be, has been because we have choice of a range of different medications that we can take. And, and I think that we should be welcoming the fact that we have yet another choice that has uh, appeared on the horizon that we can take advantage of um, to stop the spread of HIV because, you know, clearly condoms alone isn't doing it. And this is not, a, this is not about pitting one thing against the other. One, you know, condoms are better than, uh, than Truvada, so you shouldn't be using Truvada, or Truvada is better than condoms, so you shouldn't be using condoms. It's about providing people with a range of choices that, that they can um, establish the best thing for them um, to, to utilise and so I think it's incumbent upon us as a community to embrace every tool that we have available to us uh, to ensure that we keep firmly focused on the fact that HIV is the enemy, not each other, not gay men against straight men, not negative gay men against positive gay men. The enemy is HIV and we've got to do everything we can um, to ensure that we keep focus on that and utilise everything that we have available to us to ensure that we wipe this fucking thing out um, before, to, excuse my French, 
but I'm a bit passionate about it and I have an agenda, I'll freely admit, you know, I, um, uh, I, I want retribution. I've lost too many people over the years to HIV and uh, I'm determined that we uh, get some something back for, for all the people that we've lost. So I don't understand why there's tension. I think we should be embracing it and all working um, together as a community to try and maintain that HIV is the enemy and that's the thing that we need to be attacking, not each other. Simon number two, did you want to... I should have gone first. You've said everything. I agree with everything you've said. Um, I was channelling. Yeah, <laughs> I could I failed to draw, actually. Um, I suppose, I'd, yeah, I'd, again, I'd, I agree with everything that Simon said. And, and I would think that the argument around having PrEP availability, I see as coming from community as well. I mean, certainly, I think... Um, that you said certainly people I'm talking to in in the clinic and my friends are saying look we really need to have prep availability and I think it's it's used it's good for the guys that it's good for um, and there are many uh, many other things that, that guys can use and I know within the clinic the conversations we have now around HIV prevention are really complicated because we have this whole range of things what we can talk about you know strategic positioning or treatment as prevention or PEP or PrEP or you know uh, ser assaulting so I, I think it, it, it adds it adds another thing um, but I would hope that really the you know that it should be driven from the community and as a clinician and also a community member I think it's important that those two go hand in hand because I think without it there's you know, it, it's you know, and I'd argue that it, it's also not just doctors as well. There are the healthcare professionals, you know, and other agencies that are also in, involved in advocating on behalf of you know of, of gay men and 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 all people around access to sexual health. I think working in sexual health, you find that it's often those most um, so excluded in society that often to women around access to contraception and termination, transgender care, you know, gay men, HIV. I think it's you know, I think I think a community has to be involved because it is it's a, a social issue really that's just we have medication to help fix yep and, and i just want to say on that um uh, as someone working in the ad advocacy side of prep that we really need our community to be mobilized behind prep so that when governments are assessing as they're about to do travada for indication as prep and then hopefully through PBAC, that governments don't think this is something that the community isn't behind or that they're not quite ready for um, and I think it's really important that um, that we are mobilised and informed and um, aware of the risks and benefits of, of this strategy at a community level. And I think there's one one aspect I do want to add on that is that often I'll hear people in people who are sceptical of prep refer to prep as unprotected sex. And I think we need to actually respond immediately to that and say that prep is protected sex using antivirals. It is a protected form of sex, not unprotected sex, and it's extremely effective. So, um, and I think the people can leave this room, and when they're having conversations with members of the community who might say, "Oh, that's that thing that you know will bring about unprotected sex," it's no; these are people who are taking something as prescribed and having extremely effective protected sex. And we've tried to emphasise that point down in Melbourne, and I know Acon are doing similar things in Sydney around using a narrative that supports. Uh, and embraces the uh, benefits of PrEP. Um, I think there was a question down here. Yeah, a comment and a question, if I can. Um, and it, one, my comment comes on directly from what you just said. Um, I think we need to have a little bit of caution about that idea of it being protected sex uh, in terms of <coughs> other STIs. Um, I really am not entirely comfortable with the emphasis maybe that you gave Fiona about it, the evidence about STIs being, well, we don't need to worry about it. Um, it looked like behaviour and STI consequences were um, not an issue in the trials. And, you know, the point of my caution is that that was in the trials, and the trials are very special people. Um, they were particularly unusual uh, uh, recruits, um, certainly in the IPREX trial and so on, they were unusually selected gay men. Um, and I think uh, certainly our trial will um, have a bit more of a real-world lens on what happens to sexual behaviour and STIs outside of a rigidly controlled um, trial context. Um, so I think there needs to be a bit of caution about that. Um, what happens um, from here on is, is possibly going to be quite different. 
And so the language of it being protected sex, I don't think is something we can really, um, from my perspective as a sexual health physician, I can't jump into that one as confidently perhaps as the community would like. Um, so that's my comment. Um, can I just quickly overly can, popular? Can I just quickly uh, respond to that? Though? <laughs> and maybe I should have said protected, HIV protected sex. Yeah, but the HIV is going to be lost in that discussion. Sure. And, and look, I, I, I take your point, but I, I, one of the th and I have this a lot in you know in Melbourne, and often my response and our response is yes, there's that risk of STIs, um, and yes, there's that risk that there's bareback sex going on. But um, central to PrEP is screening and regular screening yeah. at three monthly intervals. And so if, um, and Fiona, please come in here um, and maybe I should get you to respond after this, but I, I, I see that uh, the, the, as, the, the capacity to increase screening amongst people on PrEP only serves to uh, enable the yeah. healthcare um, sector to actually treat people with STIs yeah. more quickly than what they would yeah. do otherwise, which could actually have the impact of, yeah. of reducing it. Yeah, and that would be the caution, yep. is to you know, even more actively promote regular uh, screening for yep. syphilis in particular. I think syphilis is something that we could easily lose control of yep. in this process. And, and as Simon said, you know, you need those three months to get the next script. You, you don't get your next script unless you have, um, uh, am I right in saying mm. that, um, unless you have screening every quarter in the trial but yep. there's a lot of stuff going on outside the trial sure and um, that's that's a whole other discussion around importing and yeah. but, I, but i suppose if people were having prep away from the trial they would still need to pick up that script and maybe that would be a, a, a discussion then while then yeah. the script is you know yeah. the providers that you yeah. do get screened and i suppose the stis are you know, maybe I'm a bit blasé, but some of them are fairly easy to treat, whereas HIV isn't. You know, like, it, it, you know, for chlamydia, it's two tablets. And I know there's a lot more around that, but I'd argue that, that, that preventing HIV, is, you know, is, yeah. it, it's probably, you know, more important than preventing chlamydia, which is, you know, currently fairly easy to treat. I'm not saying it, will ch it won't be as easy in the future, but I think HIV has more impact long term. Okay, and my question, also for you, Simon, is uh, what happens after the trial in terms of access to PrEP in Queensland? So we're having a conversation before, and I think that's sort of up to negotiate. Well, yeah, I, it's, I suppose um, that there are other conversations going on around w what will happen after the trial, and then also maybe for increasing the numbers from 50. So I suppose I'm not in a position, I, I don't know the information, so I'm not, I'm not holding information uh, back, but I think there's, there's ongoing conversations around. And I think hopefully it would be that the evidence would be there then to say, actually, no, this does work. This is what cer certain members of the community are requesting. Um, and I suppose, it, again, it's that long look at, well, the, the cost of, you know, the cost and, and whether there's anything else that can be done. That's very vague, I realise as an answer, but I suppose at the moment I don't know, but I suppose certain, certain of us will be advocating for a continuation. I think there was just a question here and then we'll go up the back afterwards. Just um, a further question, just in response to this gentleman, the physician at the front, he was talking about other STIs. Now, as a gay man, for a long time, we've been educated, if you have an STI, the risk of catching HIV doubles or triples or whatever it is. Do you think that if you did, were carrying around gonorrhea or something for a long time and you were taking Travada, could that potentially lower the um, effectiveness from about 90% down to about 30 to 40%? Does anybody know about that? Because there are a lot of STIs in our community, um, like gonorrhea and chlamydia, but my worry would be about the um, interference, you know, rather than working at 86% could come down because we're always told, oh, if you have gonorrhea or if you have chlamydia, the possibility of picking up HIV doubles or triples, or do you know what I'm sort of saying? That's, uh, do you, have we got any studies around that or anything? So, F Fiona, uh, perhaps I could ask either Fiona or Andrew. I, I, could we just hypothesise that the person um, uh, is taking prep um, in, in accordance with um, their their prescribing? You know, they're taking it as prescribed um, uh, in the context of that question. Well, I'm not aware of any trials um, specifically with respect to people on PrEP and STIs making them more likely to, to get infected. But we said, I mean, what you say is true that, you know, if you have a raging rectal gonorrhea with a breakdown of the mucosa, et cetera, you're at much greater risk of picking up other infections, including HIV. 
Um, I don't know whether if you're on PrEP, it's going to work as effectively, but what we do know about Truvada is that it does end up in the rectal tissue um, at quite high levels, which is one of the reasons why it's such a good choice for PrEP. Um, so presumably it will still work, but, but I don't know the answer to that. Do you have any other? No. I guess we might, potentially we might, I, th I, mean, I think certainly local tissue damage, you know, will allow potential risk of, you know, stuff getting into the bloodstream that otherwise might not have done so. And so we would worry about that. But I guess one of the things with PrEP is that we're really, I, I guess, hoping as a side benefit is that, is that, is that sexually active, you know, sexually active people who are at risk of HIV are potentially putting themselves in a circumstance. Well, look, I'm taking control, and and part of the way I take control of, of my risk is that is that I've got a an ongoing relationship, you know, with my healthcare clinic, and I'm getting regular testing. Um, whereas, if prep's not available, then perhaps it might be easier to you know to let time slide between regular visits, and, and you know, and instead of getting the three monthly test, it becomes the six monthly or nine monthly. Oh my goodness, it's you know it's that time of year again, and so this is an opportunity for some more engagement and you know potentially empowering you know empowering sexually active people to you know help look after that. But I think really the actual science is not really well sorted out. Um, there's a gentleman up the back. So with uh, PrEP, uh, this, we're all in Brisbane right now, but I've had people contact me, I work here at Rapid, from regional or remote Queensland looking for PrEP even off-label or scripts and they're finding it difficult getting GPs because of where they live to actually prescribe Travada. Um, is there a potential solution in the mix, like in terms of a recommendation more medically for prep coming because yeah the guys are so, so, well a few of the guys have been quite desperate for it and been jumping driving hours to try and find different GPs to find someone who will sit down and have at least a conversation about prep. So so you, you the, the the question is are there doctors basically who um, can be identified as as willing to have a discussion around prescribing Travada off label. Definitely, especially for regional or remote yep. Queensland because yeah, if, if people are, are calling here in Brisbane yep. um, and they live all the way in Rocky. Yep. Uh, for it's a really good question. <laughs> yep. Um, look, I'm from quite a, sure who can, I might just yeah. briefly say, look, from a structural viewpoint, doctors get nervous about prescribing um, drugs off label and, um, and really doctors are much more likely to be prepared to have a discussion about it if there's some sort of some sort of local guideline or, or, or set of rules or, or guidance about it and to that end ASHAM are putting together a, uh, a, a guideline about the use of PrEP for Australia. Um, it's, it's, uh, I, I had a conversation last week with someone who's on on the antiretrovirals guidelines scientific review panel and was told that, that the review panel had signed off on it and um, and so it's not necessarily going to be a recommendation but it's going to be an Australian expert um, guidance on the use of PrEP and I think that that would be something that potentially um, people in, in, in regional and remote places could point to for their practitioners. I think there's still going to be a lot of GPs out there who are not familiar with sexual health care who will struggle with it. Um, but I think that might be a small benefit. Realistically, you know, for somewhere like Rocky, for example, there's a sexual health clinic in Rocky and, and, I, and I think that everybody's learning on the run here. Some people People in you know Brisbane, for example, we're getting we're getting to learn a lot faster because our you know our people are coming to us and, and asking us you know every week. But um, on the other hand, if you're in Rocky or Mackay or Dolby, um, you know the learning process is going to be a lot slower. And I think having that the the you know the professional body able to put out a guidance is going to be helpful. Um, but I think I suspect you know in, in the background of your question is is a doctor going to provide prep sight unseen to a, to a client who they don't know, I think that's going to be really difficult for, for off-label medication. Yep. 
And so we know that Gilead are in the pre-application phase, which means that it's probably at least a couple of years away at the best from being um, indicated or approved here for PrEP. I think I'd be fair in saying that, Andrew. Yeah. Um, it's it's quarter to eight and I still we've got some questions. So perhaps I think the three hands went up then. So perhaps if we make respond to all those three and, and call it at that. Um, thanks. Um, so as I understand it, um, there's a real risk of people commencing on prep and potentially making themselves worse off in the sense that if they are um, HIV or they, they seroconvert um, during that first short period, um, they, they'll be resistant to Travada and things like that. Is that, I just want some clarity on exactly the risk um, that people starting prep were going to. Fiona or Andrew, either one of you want to? I'll talk. Um, look, uh, I guess we, we know that from, you know, back in the early 90s when we treated people with two nucleosides that there was a reduction, people who already had HIV, there was a reduction in the viral load and there was a transient reduction in, in, in disease, but then the virus always came, always came back and that the virus is, is cunning enough to get around two nucleosides. And um, look, one of these is a nucleotide and one's a nucleoside, but functionally, you know, that's the situation and I think that um, that there would be a real real risk. I think people are probably going to be okay for about two weeks and after about two weeks, you know, that's when there's going to be a significant risk. And, 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 um, and so I think it, it is going to be really important for people who are starting PrEP to just have a, have, a, have a clear process where they can be confident that they don't already have HIV. And, um, and so both in terms of just when they've been at risk, when was the last test, and, and having symptoms of, uh, of, of seroconversion. In some of the studies where there have been people who've seroconverted um, very early in the study, they've reported that, that, that almost all of them would have been detected if there had been questions asked about seroconversion. But quite frankly, the studies are small. They're not thousands of people. And, um, and, and I think that we just need to be really careful. I was having this discussion last week in, in, the, in the clinic about, about, about just, you know, how, how my patient was going to manage time prior to starting PrEP as, um, you know, how he was going to manage that so that he avoided that risk. And I think there is a significant risk um, and, and it's, it's a part of, of you know, taking, taking ownership of, of just how you look after yourself, I think. And I guess that's what concerns me when it comes to the actual sorry um, when it comes to the actual trial is that the necessity is that we have um, had unprotected sex within those three months prior to. So that really concerns me in the sense that you know um, I, I'd want to stop having sex probably two months prior to going on the trial just so that I wouldn't be in that risk because that risk could at the moment with some of those trials is maybe one percent, but that's only of a hundred people. That's that's still a risk. Um, but I guess what I want to know is the other drugs that are available. Um, like, is it is it is it a really big deal if Travada doesn't work? Like, will it? Like, what is the actual risk? So I'm a HIV negative person. I really don't know much about um, HIV when it comes to what drugs are available and what treatments. So that's a real big concern for me wanting to go on a trial. Yeah. Look, uh, I guess I'd really hope that in the in the setting of a trial that in the setting of the trial that, 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 that we can manage that around discussion and interviewing and thinking about making a risk assessment about that. Um, and I'd hope that would be manageable. To the second issue of what happens if I get HIV and the virus is resistant to the two drugs that are in PrEP, what happens to me now? We've got lots of really great drugs in the cupboard um, and I think that things are going, you know, I th I'd be confident that we, that we can, we can look after your HIV now. I guess it does up the stakes for making sure we do a really good job with treatment. Um, and certainly um, there have been many people who, who have had HIV treatment who have really struggled and because of various struggles to do with drug interactions or poor absorption or not being good at taking the medications um, or inadvertent mismatch between the medications chosen and resistance that the virus already has, 
have burnt through one or even two regimens. That's a lot less common now, and I think we we have a better, much better understanding. I, I'd be pretty confident we can still treat someone really well, um, but I guess it's not where either us or the patients would want to be. Thanks. Thanks for those um, questions too. They're really good community grassroots questions. Thanks. Uh, yep. Andrew, just a quick one on statistics, I guess. You said it's 86% safe if people have uh, no other form of protection, but it went off the chart because some people didn't take their pills. You alluded that you thought it was much higher, a safety factor. What percentage do you think it would be? Just at a guess, and nobody's going to hold you to it. And also, how does that compare to men having um, sex unprotected that are circumcised in their tops? And also, are you looking for mostly bottoms for the trial? So there's a whole host of interesting questions there. Um, <laughs> I've been taking lessons from Phil. Um, so look, the 86% effectiveness is really just calculated from the numbers of people who got HIV versus, you know, in the in the two different arms. So and uh, and the people who I got I got to I listened to I didn't go to Croy but I, I listened to the webcast so I could hear the talk that was given and look at the slides and and they went some way to try to explain about well this person this is what happened to them and that's our excuse for that positive that failure and this one this is the case there so but really when you look at those I think that if people are, are good at taking prep I, I I'd be really hoping for very close to 100% effectiveness. I guess the circumstances under which there would be failure would be those that have already been mentioned. What if there's an episode of, of rectal gonorrhea and it's just a higher risk? Um, what, if there's, um, what if there's drug interactions and the drug is not well absorbed? Um, what if there's a problem like that? So, um, so I think that you know, the headline figure for people taking the drug really well I think is going to be very high. However, I think there are some potential frailties about it. Um, and because they're very individual, they, I think it's hard to, to you know, interpret those individual things into statistics. But I would expect that if you have you know, 200 people in a room, for example, and they're all taking PrEP really well and they're adhering to the drug, my expectation really is that, is that the effectiveness is going to be greater than 90%. How does that compare with, say, uncircumcised people who are who are tops there's a lot of variables there depending on on who they're having sex with whether there's trauma um, whether there's lube um, there's lots of variations and, and I my feeling is that is that I would be counseling people that it's great that you're you know that you are uncircumcised that's a, a, a small pro protective risk factor sort of you know two-thirds protective um, it's great that you're a top that's a, a minor pro that's a somewhat protective factor as well but I, I think I'd still be arguing with with my patient that he's going to be even better off on prep as well um, I can't really give you good stats I'm afraid <laughs> but it's a it's a negotiation and it's a discussion and you know, I might prescribe it but you know, I'm not the one who's there in the bathroom taking it, and uh, and it's about what what makes what people are prepared to do, what people want to do. Thank you. Was there one? Yep, just in front of the cameraman. Uh, um, Simon, too. Um, you mentioned um, that you could probably very easily fill 50 spaces in cans almost almost overnight. Um, I imagine that the case is true for Brisbane as well. Why is the case number um, of 50 uh, chosen? Why is it so small and what are the chances of it being expanded? So I, I think it's purely sort of financial. Well, I, th I think the original discussion was we thought that maybe 50 would, would be a number that we could fill across the state because there wasn't so much interest in, in, um, in prep at the time. Um, and, and then I also think that it, it, it's also around how much we in the clinic can actually cope with all the paperwork coming in and also the, the, the cost of running the trial as well. 
but I think we will be in negotiation with the HIV Foundation and then other people as well around that. So it's very much, it's like a step in the right direction almost. So it, it's a manageable amount that we can manage and afford at the moment. But certainly if there's, if there's more and more interest in it, then, then we would then be in. So it's a bit of a two-way street. It's not like this is set in stone and, and this is it. You know, it'd be very much in, in discussion with the HIV Foundation as, as to whether whether we needed to increase. But I suppose until we start recruiting, we don't know. We are assuming we can, you know, fill 50 places in Cairns. As I say, we won't. So it's, to Cairns is not a priority site up at all. Um, but obviously, we will sort of see how that goes. But initially, it was around what we could feasibly manage and, and what we could also afford. Thanks. I'm just conscious that it's about five to eight, so I think we should probably end it there. I just want to say these questions, I mean, I, this is probably the 10th or 11th prep forum that I've been involved in. It's probably the most grassroots one that I've, that I've been to. There's some really good questions tonight that we were able to um, respond to in terms of learning about prep. So I want to thank you all for coming and participating and contributing to the, the Australian discussion on, on prep, whether it's Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane or, or anywhere else in Australia. Um, I think we should all thank the three presenters and Simon O'Connor for sitting on the panel. Um, I think they really rounded out the whole conversation. Thank you to um, HIV Foundation Queensland. And I hope this isn't the last prep forum in Queensland, so I hope that there's a need for more forums in the future. Um, thank you for bringing me up here to contribute. It's been great. Um, just a, a message at the end. There's an online Facebook forum. Um, Samuel, I think, is there some little brochures somewhere um, that Mel Melissa has? If everyone could grab one of those, and it'd be great to continue the discussion online. That, that happens, or it's you know, a very effective way of continuing discussions. I'm sure if there are technical questions that they will assist, uh, the Foundation will assist in responding to those. And I just want to give a bit of a plug for a petition that VAC started, but it is national on change.org. We've started a um, petition um, requesting the approval of PrEP Down Under. So if you are interested in seeing this approved, jump onto change.org and type in approved PrEP Down Under and sign up to it. So thank you very much for coming. There's some food and drink left, so I think people can hang around and, and continue the conversation. Thanks.